the evening by introducing our special guests into the room. First of all, it's a player who means a lot to Blackpool Football Club, not only on the pitch, but also in the community as well. His contribution in the Blackpool community over many years is equal to that on the pitch. Northern Ireland International, please put your hands together for Derek Spence. What a goalkeeper this man is. Still lives in the town, he absolutely loves the club and we love him. Put your hands together for Alan Taylor. One of the greatest and nicest gentlemen in the country. It's Des McBain. Sign Tony Green for Blackpool Football Club. Come on! Such a warrior. Put your hands together for Bill Bentley. Terry Olcott. He's a favourite of many. Such a wonderful man. Loves the club to bits. Dennis Wong. Come on, Steve. Let's have you up. You've already sat down. You need an introduction. Steve Trainer. Played for Blackpool Football Club. Late 70s, early 80s. Steve. You deserve an introduction as well, sir. I haven't forgotten, Clinton has played in American Art Stadium. 200,000 people, Rio de Janeiro, not bad. Clint James, top man, top defender, Clint James. Signed for Blackpool, late 60s. Another great guy, big Blackpool fan. Who remembers John Hughes? said often, but they don't actually get bigger than Liverpool legend Ian Callaghan. Yeah. Ian Callaghan, everyone! Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, the last Newcastle captain to lift silverware back in 1969, a real legend of the game, Bobby Munker! Yeah. We are absolutely honoured, delighted, privileged that you're all here tonight to pay tribute to a man that's just turned 75 years young. It's absolutely the right thing to do for us all to be here. Long overdue, it's taken 50 years for us to put on a dinner to recognise the achievements of this man that many of you saw, but many people like me, the tales came from our late fathers and people within our families that rate this man so, so highly as one of the gods of Blackpool Football Club. When I mentioned to him about holding a dinner a couple of months ago to celebrate his landmark birthday, his response was exactly the same that Jimmy Arnfield gave me when I put on an event at the Tower which Mrs Kate Shane so fabulously helped me organise a number of years ago for Jimmy's 80th. Tony said, it's a lovely idea, Chris, but nobody will turn up. <laughs> Jimmy said exactly the same thing, nobody will turn up. That's the level of the modesty and the unassuming and understated nature of these absolute legends. We sold 350, we could have sold a thousand tonight, because people love this man, and he's the reason why people fall in love with this game. And his name is Tony Green. <laughs> photographs being taken. Just another 60 seconds and get your picture. Look at this here. Amazing. Hughes, McBain, Thaler, Bentley, Spence, Green, Wong, Moncur, James, Olcott. Tony was one of my favourite ever players. I used to sit in the northwest stand with my dad when I was four year old. So I've been watching them forever. 
but Tony is my absolute idol. Then there were the sublime skills of Tony Green, a Scottish international from Blackpool. Injury was to cut short his career, but little could diminish his esteem in the eyes of discerning United fans. He got a serious injury and he came back from the injury in a reserve game. I think it might have been against Man City, I'm not sure. And 8,000 people turned up in his comeback at Bloomfield Road for the reserves. A fantastic occasion. Imagine that 8,000 at a reserve game. Oh, he was one of the best, I was just saying to John here, along with Alan Ball, they were probably, I'm talking about forwards, and not people like Jimmy Arthur as the defender, I'm talking about forwards, those two were probably the best two I played with. Tony played against Paulie for the Welsh under 23s and he was with England under 23s. So we played each other against each other at Wrexham. What an absolute thrill it is to be with one of English football's greatest ever strikers, Malcolm McDonald. Malcolm, thank you so much for joining us on this special evening for a special friend of yours. Well, uh, thank you very much indeed, Chris. And uh, I have to say that was uh, uh, quite some uh, welcome to the uh, to the whole evening from you. Thank you so much. And. Uh, well, I wouldn't do this for everybody, but Greeny was always somebody very special, I think, not just with me and the other players in the dressing room at St. James, but uh, oh, the, the, the crowd just loved him. The people of Newcastle absolutely adored him. And uh, he, he, uh, he, in a very short while, he had a, a very powerful uh, and welcoming effect here on Tyneside. Yeah, the first memories of uh, Tony Green are probably the most fortunate that anyone could ever have. As a big father, 
in the West End, the Woodland West End. Um, I had watched Blackpool for about a year and we played West Ham. Yes, that West Ham game. And I saw Tony Green take out the team on and score against England players, quality of West Ham. I mean, we talk about that best, best, best and still best and that goal we scored against Chelsea. I remember that as well, about four years later. But I'm a Blackpool fan. So to be there to watch that's amazing. Apart from having this wonderful, warm, embracing personality, um, he's a very funny guy. So the atmosphere in the dressing room just lifted when he walked through the door. Uh, and uh, he had a, a, a wonderful sense of humour. But then, of course, it's down to business and you go down the tunnel um, and out onto the pitch. And Greeny, he had immense individual skills, um, but he was so generous out on the pitch. He would always look to pay people in. He would always look to, to, to make you the favorite um, as he passed the ball to you. Uh, um, and always just so thoughtful in the way that he went about his life, his job and everything else. Scottish, Irish, Georgie Best. Pink ball upon halfway line and they could not get the ball off him. He went up and scored. Brilliant player. And then he went to Newcastle and sadly he ended his career. Magnificent player and I love him. And I'm going to have my photograph took with him later on with him and Bobby Monke. Strange old thing happened. Um, I was watching the Man United Newcastle game, and Ronaldo, of course, he had a bit of a, uh, um, you know, it's his second debut, and and, and and it was a massive return to Old Trafford for him. But in the game, I watched him running, and he's got that uh, um, high stepping style. And I looked, and I thought, good heavens, the other player. Who I, who I saw doing that was Tony Green. He had that high stepping motion. Um, and what it does is, uh, um, it bamboozles defenders because they really do not know which way they're gonna go. When people stay low, uh, it, it becomes a bit easier for defenders to read because automatically their shoulders will, will take them, will sway. But when it's high stepping, there is no upper body movement at all. Um, and, and so people don't know which way Ronaldo is going to go. And that was the same with Greeny. Nobody knew which way he was going to go. Uh, and, and so he was always making space for himself, always just uh, um, wrong footing a defender and, uh, and going beyond. We're always good friends, always been good friends. But the only thing I would say, don't let him look after your rabbits. Because when I live next to him, uh, with me, my youngest son, who was about uh, 18 months old, had two rabbits. And we went home to Stoke for about four days and I said, asked Greeny to look after the rabbit. Unfortunately, when we came back, both the rabbits were dead. And my son still affecting, he's never watched more to sit down ever since. <laughs> but the difference between Greeny and Ronaldo, apart from uh, uh, a, a, a few tens of millions of quid, um, is that, that with Greeny, he had the benefit of a fantastic shot from distance wonderful shot from distance and that was the first time that he came to my attention um, he was playing for Blackpool I remember it was in the FA Cup and it was on match of the day West Ham United it was, it was West Ham wasn't it yes I wondered whether it was it was West Ham United and Greavesy and, played and Greavesy played that day too yes for West Ham United yes. absolutely um, and uh, all of a sudden, this high-stepping midfield player 
player for Blackpool. And I think they were in the, was it second or third division at the time? One or the other. And all of a sudden, he's just unleashed this shot from over 30 yards. And wow, straight in the top corner. And I just looked mesmerised at the screen and I thought, wow. I hope Joe Harvey's seen it. <laughs> and he had. Yes. Absolutely. And the next thing we knew, Greeny was walking in through the, the dressing room door. And and I can't I can't think of a of a more welcome guy than uh, than Greeny. When was that taken? Uh, the presentation night a couple of years ago probably. Can I just ask you, just take you back to that full season that you played together. Well, nearly a full season because, of course, Tony joined in the October. You joined in the summer from Luton Town for a record fee of £180,000. Tony yeah. joined in a joint deal which was worth £150,000. You were Newcastle's biggest ever signing at the time. Tony was Newcastle's second biggest signing at the time. You were, yeah. at the, you were towards the bottom of the table and then went on a seven-match unbeaten run and ended up finishing the top half. What sort of impact did Tony have with you, Malcolm, during the, in that team in that season? He just lifted every, everyone, everything, not just in the dressing room, but the crowd as well. Uh, he, he, was, he was great with the journalists, and, and so there was, there was all good stuff being, being written. And, uh, and he, he brought a a really feel-good factor uh, with his arrival. Uh, um, and it just, it, it gave everybody a boost. And, and yeah, we, we were sort of uh, um, looking to find our way as a sort of fairly new team that had been put together at the beginning of that season. And w what I think um, was that Tony and, and the way that he was, uh, um, his personality, his character, he was the last cog um, in, that, in that mystery of putting a team together. And it all just clicked. And, and, and boy, we really did start to play some stuff. And uh, we were scoring for fun. And yes, we elevated up the table. And, uh, and, and it was... Oh, it was really, really great to be playing in that side. It really was. It was such a delight. Not only was he such a skillful player, but he was obviously the target for the hatchet man. And he had this terrific temperament that whenever he was hacked down, he just never retaliated other than with football and making fools out of people with the football. And of course, there's a memorable match against West Ham when he tore them apart. And uh, the fact that uh, the excuses were made that they were on the razzle the night before, that's no excuse. Tony Green tore them apart. But yeah, it was wonderful, wonderful to watch. And um, of course, when we realised or heard that he was being sold to Newcastle, that was truly devastating. But these things happen and you've got to get on with it. But there is only one Tony Green. Malcolm, can I ask you, from somebody that didn't see Tony play for Newcastle, and many of us didn't, but we look at the record books and we see that he played only 39 games, yeah. 33 of which in the league, yet he has been inducted into Newcastle United's Hall of Fame back in 2008. How does a player who only made 39 appearances for a club make such an impression on the Jody folk? Because Greeny is somebody really, really special. You know, there's nothing bland about Greeny in any shape or form. He is the most wonderful character, the most wonderful company to be with. I envy everybody uh, um, tonight who, who are uh, sitting in his company. I, I really do wish I was there. Uh, he, he, he's one of those guys, uh, he walks through a door and he lightens the room up. He brightens it. Um, I, I, and, and it's a rare gift. It really is. And Green has got it. Uh, and 
the crowd took to him and I've and I've seen players toll for season after season and still the crowd are giving them a bit of stick. Greeny, he walked out, out of the tunnel and woof, everybody. <coughs> everybody just loved him from the word go and that has never altered and when he comes to St James Park, and it's lovely to see him there when he does come over, uh, when he comes there, that love is still there and so apparent and uh, and he's just one of those absolutely loved people. But I say that, but Tony was always a very giving person of himself. Uh, uh, and a great social person, a great social person too. Oh, absolutely, yes. Oh, yes. You know that he, he'd get talking in a in a in a pub and finish up being there all night just chatting to the Newcastle supporters. Um, I don't think his wife was too impressed, but the supporters absolutely loved it. <laughs> Can I just say finally, Malcolm, because it's wonderful to get this tribute and it really is a special, special tribute and set of words that you've given us tonight. But Joe Harvey, your manager at the time, sadly, as we know, Tony wasn't even 26 when he had to retire and you were there on the on that game against Crystal Palace where Unfortunately, that injury uh, curtailed what would have been an absolutely even more glittering career. Uh, Joe Harvey actually said, after they made Tony Green, they threw away the mould. I couldn't hope to buy a similar player, not even for twice the amount. It was the saddest day of my life. He was my very best buy. I'm sure you'd concur with that. Absolutely. Oh, I couldn't argue with that one iota. Um, that, uh, uh, and not only was I on the pitch when that when when the dreadful incident happened with his injury uh, but I was actually just two yards behind him we had, we had been uh, we'd been attacking the Crystal Palace penalty area had broken down and Crystal Palace then started to move up the pitch and so we turned and Greeny was was about two yards ahead of me as we were running back to get it to get to our own half and and his his boot just slightly twisted down in, into a divot hole. That's all it was. He he, uh, um, he just trod awkwardly on a uh, on a divot hole, and and it turned um, his foot. Uh, and uh, uh, well, the the noise that it was made it was like a rifle shot, like a, you know the crack of a rifle shot, um, and. The whole ground just went very quiet um, and, and down green he went and it was obvious that he was in dreadful, dreadful pain. Um, and uh, uh, some while later after he had been operated on, I had an operation uh, to, uh, um, uh, and I came out of plaster and I joined Greeny at training and, and mine was improving, his never did and it was absolutely heartbreaking um, to see this absolutely magnificent footballer so struggling to try to find fitness and, and never finding it of course uh, um, and I think it was I think it was one of the most sad um, times um, that I've ever experienced in football um, that, uh, when, um, when Tony had to finally call it a day it, it was how, how could, absolutely how, heartbreaking. How could could how good could he have been, Malcolm? I mean, oh. or, or is that or is that part of Tony's legacy? The fact that we saw the brilliance he, and and it's and it's left to our imagination. Uh, well, it's easy to imagine because what we saw in those in those um, thirty nine games, um, it, it oh dear me, the world was his oyster. Uh, um, uh, and he, he was already in the Scotland side. Um, that, that was um, when he remembered to take his boots with him. Um, uh, uh, he, he was just going to get better and better and better. But the real beauty about him was not only was he self-improving, but he made all the players around him better as well. And that's a rare gift. Malcolm, we treasure your time, we treasure your words. Just one final message for Tony and the group tonight who are with him. Well, have a fabulous time, Greeny. 
Um, I wish I was there. I'm sorry I'm not. But I'm sure that uh, I should be seeing you at some point when you pop over to St. James Park for a match. Um, and have a, not only a fabulous night with everybody, uh, really enjoy it. And when don't you enjoy a night out? Um, but uh, have a super year and uh, stay well. Good luck, mate. Greeny, I'm just saying the lads from North Shore, we just got to say one thing. Uh, it was a great time at Mottra Bowl. Enjoy it. We were going to be playing Bologna on the Saturday, but we had a few days to spare. So we stayed at a beautiful hotel in Monte Catini. We, we dropped all our stuff off. The lads dropped all their gear off in the rooms. We all dived down to the swimming pool and were swimming. Bob Stoker and I were sat in the lounge and all of a sudden Tony and Tommy Hutchie turned up and said, hey Des, our clothes have gone missing. I said, well they can't have oh yes they've gone missing. I said, right, come on. So we shoot up to the room, go in the room, sure enough, there's no sign of the bags. Open the wardrobes, they've all been put away. <laughs> that meant we went back to the pool. We were quite happy then. My great friend and everybody's friend, Jimmy Armfield. We'd only played probably two or three matches. He came to me and he said, Des, please do me a favour. Wrap Tony in cotton wool, will you, to the next game? Because he's earning us a lot of money in win bonuses. First of all, we ask Jennifer Alan Taylor, who's going to tell us a little story about Tony and about his time. Tell, tell me about Tony. Back to 1969, uh, I was in Wrightington, up in the cartridge yard. Um, One second, Alan, I'm just going to get a silence for you. Thank you. Harry Johnson brought Tony through to see Mr. Barnes. And I don't know whether he remembers, on our way back, we had a little bet. He bet me that he would be playing before I was. And unfortunately, he spent the rest of the season not playing. I, I played after eight weeks, and I still haven't received any money from him. Dennis, truthful, truthful one, yeah. yeah, yeah. Come on, then. Well, I was signed at Blackpool in 1966, and I played in a youth cup match here. And as you used to do in those days, there was a building called the Mecca over there, and we went for a couple of beers after. And Tony must have been down here, uh, and I saw him at the bar. And the very first night Tony was here, me and him had a beer. It certainly wasn't the last. But my lasting memory of Tony, uh, if you weren't in the team, or you weren't in the Central League team, you would come and watch the first team play. And in them days, I guess 17,000 something. And the thing that struck me, when Tony received the ball, this buzz emanated from all round the ground. And I think it was a buzz of expectancy and excitement that something special would happen. And a lot of times it did. And I particularly remember one day, Malcolm McDonald alluded to it, when Blackpool played West Ham here. Three World Cup winning players in the team. And I think Tony gave the then England captain, a very good player, Bobby Moore, the biggest run around he probably ever had. <laughs> and it was fantastic. It was a privilege to watch him. Little Pepsi, everyone. Not coming back, old boy. Oh, I am. I'm a stout lad, but I was. Baptised in Blackpool, I know. Uh, you always said Stoke was my first love. This, well, was my mistress. <laughs> so it's a good time to miss it. We had to have some fun with my mistress, didn't we? It's a fabulous place. The lads I played with, these lads, the other lads were not here. And it was, it was basically just like a family. You know, we all got on and we had some good time. He's the same in the dressing room, he's the same on the pitch. If he could help you out, he helped you out. And he got us out of trouble a few times. And I always remember the day we, we were training down at Squire's Gate, the day he did his accolades. And he's 
we were having a practice game and he's running down the outside and suddenly he just went bang. And he looked round, he thought somebody kicked him, but it just exploded, didn't it? So they got him fed eventually and getting him there. But what he had to, what he had turned in, he, he finished up with a boot with seven can you remember he had seven pieces and he used to take he knows more than me. Yeah. <laughs> he used to take and every so often he'd go down for side of stuff with me and he always kind of left off me. You know, oh come on out and so and but old Vinnie Conway turned in he he was different class. He wasn't the best physio in the world, but he got everybody fit <laughs> into somehow. You know what I mean? <laughs> but no, he's top class lad. Like you said, you've talked about the West Ham game. Uh, and all the other games in, when we were in, uh, in Italy. But apart from the player he is, to me, he's my mate. That will mean that. Gary Spence, everybody. When I came to Blackpool, um, I, I knew the name Tony Green. To be perfectly honest, I was a very, very unlucky person because I'd never seen him play alive. But I do remember distinctly coming in this room a number of years ago and they showed some clips of Tony Green. And I could not believe what I was looking at. And I don't say this just casually. I was looking at another George Best. Because the George Best that I used to watch and idolised as a kid, I could see in him. The same movement, the same dribbling. And I thought, oh my. God, what a player. But there wasn't enough clips to see more. I wanted more, I wanted more. And um, and, and that was a lasting impression. And, and again, tonight I've seen them clips again and I can still see George Best. And I think Malcolm McDonald uh, summed it up fantastically. Um, so yeah, as a person, I've met him on numerous occasions. And he's always the same yeah. person. And that's what I love about him because he's always laughing. He always gives me a bit of stick for talking to you. I'll, I'll definitely stop now. No, go on, I'll <laughs> definitely stop now. In time for everything. If anybody you wanted someone to knock a pile of pennies over, Tony was there. You know, kids at the hospital at Christmas, Tony was there. So, what everybody said, the accolades we had. There isn't enough about the man that's been said. Loves I'm sure there's far more. Love the words, carry up the words. Everybody, everybody was frightened of him. They, they didn't like to get too close to him because they just skinned him. Um, he was a superb player. Obviously, the best player I played. And in your time, because obviously you've been associated with Blackpool Football Club for Goodness me, over 50 years, well over 50 years. Where does he rank in the Blackpool players that you've seen play? Number one. Number one. <laughs> this man made such an impact on the English game and such an impact on Liverpool Football Club. I listed the accolades, the numerous FA Cups, the numerous league championships, two European Cups when it was only the team that qualified as the champion of the country and also the Football Writers Association Play of the Year on two occasions, Mr. Ian Callaghan, MD. <laughs> Ian, your reflections on, firstly, Tony as a player. Well, you know, I mean, I've got to know Tony. Uh, through the pools panel. Um, you know, I've been, I knew he was a fantastic player. I really did. Uh, you know, Newcastle, down, down here, Blackpool. Um, but what everybody says about Tony Green is absolutely right. Because it was, uh, I got introduced to him, um, I was on the spot the ball panel with Brian LeVoe and David Sadler. Of course, Tony was on the pools panel with Banksy and my great friend, Roger Hunt, uh, and became Tony's best friend as well. And so, you know, Roger used to tell me about Tony, the person he was, and 
it, it was exactly right because you know when I first met Tony, um, he was just a, the nicest guy you know you could ever wish to meet. Um, since then, you know, I've had a few years with him and Chris, and uh, you know everything that's been said about him is absolutely true. It really is true, and. You know, I mean, as a player, somebody just mentioned, you know, like Bestie, you know, you know, and he, he reckoned, you know, he was like in the same style. And, you know, you can't get a better accolade than that, because Bestie was absolutely fantastic. And this man must have been, yeah. Thank you, Ian. Oh, just can I ask you, um, your memories of Tony, have you got a favourite memory <coughs> of your time with Tony, travelling with Tony on the pools one? Anything you can actually tell us? <laughs> what are you going to say? <laughs> <laughs> I once was sat with him and I said to him, um, how many games did you play for Liverpool? He said, 857. And Brian Lebon says, don't listen to him, every time he gets pissed, he has 10 on <laughs> person in here, 350 people, we could have sold a thousand, 50 years after Tony left Blackpool, the reverence in the room that we have for Tony is very similar to the reverence I'm sure that Liverpool Football Club fans have for you. Just tell me though, what what does it mean? What is this, what, Tony's contribution to this club, you look around this room, absolutely packed on a Friday night in November, what does that say about the man? Well I think it says everything about the man, you know, I mean... All that's been said tonight, you know, as a player, you know, he's a very, very special player. But for me, you know, I haven't met him uh, on the Pools panel. Um, he's a very, very special man. He really is. And, uh, you know, I mean, uh, it's a joy to go in every week uh, with Tony, do the Pools panel, and he's always absolutely fantastic as a person. Really and you're absolutely fantastic for coming here tonight to be with us yeah. and pay tribute to this time. The respect that we have for you, Mr. Callaghan, is immense. Ian Callaghan, MBE, please put your hands together. We've heard so many fabulous tributes to him tonight, and every one of them has been on the money. Have we ever heard anyone say a bad word about Tony Green? Greeny turned 75 years young last week, signed for the pool by the legend Morty in 67 for £13,500. Tony's got a little story to tell about that shortly. Morty would go on to be a lifelong friend of Tony's, more than a friend. Green was the son Morty never had. Often inseparable, Morty would introduce Tony to the pool's panel and a lifetime of stories, some of which we'll hear very shortly. Tony went on to make 123 appearances, scoring 13 goals for Blackpool. Helped lift the Anglo-Italian Cup in 71, then joined Newcastle, as we heard. Tony then settled on the Fowl Coast after his football career. Taught maths at Hobson in Polton, Millfield, I believe, also at Thornton. Tony has served for 48 years on the Pools panel without one day off. With the likes of Morty, Gordon Banks, Ian Callaghan, Roger Hunt and many other legends. Tony was inducted into the Hall of Fame at Bloomfield Road when it was officially opened by former teammate and absolute legend Jimmy Armfield in April 2006. <laughs> Tonight is not just for Tony, it's for every fan here that saw Tony play. For all of our fathers who aren't with us, who idolise this man to the nth degree, all those that can't be with us tonight. Only the great late Bobby Moore, no less, said that only two players, Pele and Tony Green, caused him problems on the football field.
Tony Green played for three clubs in his far too short career, yet still, he is in all three halls of fame. Like my father and so many people in this room who saw Tony play, Tony play have said that Tony Green is their all-time favourite player to watch in a tangerine, and that also comes from John Arnfield, the son of Jim. I'm confident when I say tonight, as I'm about to introduce the great man forward, that many fans in Tangerine, when they think of the Holy Trinity, when it comes to Blackpool Football Club, and our very, very top legends, they think of Jimmy Armfield, they think of Sam Mortensen, and they think of Tony Green. The Holy Trinity. Tony is the very reason why many Blackpool fans of his era and subsequent generations have fallen in love with this club and with football. Ladies and gentlemen, your main man tonight and for many more nights to come. Please put your hands together for the great Tony Green. Um, does everybody know Steve Hurst? Yeah, well, when he died, I was stood there, and his um, son came up and said to me, he says, you know, he says, you're my dad's hero. And he says, every time I know you, he says, guess who I've been with? And I said, dead nice. And they talked to me for half an hour, and I went to the bar over there, and his dad, who was 89, brings the button, said, do you know where you are, our Steve's hero? And I says, yeah. And then he went, he says, you know, he says, I've supported this club for 70 years. He says, and I must admit, and I was getting quite proud, he says, I didn't think you were that fucking good. <laughs> and, and I just stood there, and his granddaughter, I couldn't stop laughing. Come on, Tony, let's just start right at the beginning. Tell me about the early days at Albion Rovers, where they spotted you and your early contract there. Well, I started with Albion Rovers and we used to get, um, there's 400 and my brother and my dad used to come and watch us and they knew everybody. And we used to be on £7 a week, £5 a win. And if you get injured, you just don't get £7. If you get dropped, you only get four pounds. And I played for a season, never missed a game. Played four months, and then I fell and broke my arm. And I got four pounds. And I didn't know what he was doing. This. Johnny Dillon was my pal. And he said, do you want me to talk to the chairman? I just, I was 18 at the time, and I just went in and says, I think you've made a mistake. I says, you've only given me four pounds. He says, I was going to drop you anyway. <laughs> and that's what it was like. So we get to a stage where you've clearly made a big impact in Albion Rovers and Stan's come up looking at players and obviously he's spotted you. Talk us through that. Well, he, he told us later, um, he was, the, he said they had to go on a Friday what he was doing at the weekend. And they said to him, um, he says, I'm going to watch Albion Rovers. So they said to him, um, don't sign Tony Green because he's um, not big enough and more important, he's not good enough. So Stan just went and, um, and then he says, come back on the Monday and he says, I've signed Tony Green, he says, I'm playing him on Saturday. And he says, you could hear a pin drop, they weren't happy, but it worked out okay. <laughs> I mentioned it in the introduction, but it's hard to overstate the link and the bond between you and Morty, isn't it? Yeah, well, he, he didn't have any kids, and he saved me, and I did well, and we just he used to, you know, if he was going somewhere, he'd come and pick us up, and we got on great, and then 
it was him that asked people to get me on the pools panel and then we started going to London every week and he's, he was the loveliest man, honestly. And it was funny because people, if they didn't know him, Stan Martin's just go through in the cup final, they think he would talk about football, but all he does is tell you jokes. <laughs> and me and Roger Hunt would hear the same jokes every week. <laughs> every single week. And we met a stranger, we'd say, tell them that one, Stan. He'd tell them, and the truth would piss myself laughing. <laughs> and, he was honestly, he was, you know, Terry, he was just this amazing man. It was, it's a wonderful story about how si uh, Stan signed you from Albion Rovers and the, uh, the coin toss and all that. Yeah, well, we, I was watching the cup fight and I come home to meet my girlfriend, who is my wife. <laughs> uh, no, sorry about that, here. Who was my wife, now my ex-wife. Oh, I've fucked up. I'll try it again. I come home from the cup final and saw my girlfriend, who's now my ex wife. Sorry about that. And I saw these two strangers and my dad. And my dad was walking up the road and somebody said to him, do you know where Tony Green lives? And he says, I'm his dad, he says, he's going to sign for Blackpool tonight. So he, my dad jumped in the car and so he was waiting when I got there. And then we were listening to them haggling about the money. And I forget, and Morty said to Tommy Fagan, we'll toss you for 500 pounds. And Morty will win the, always win the toss. So you win the toss. When you came to Blackpool, am I right in saying there were five internationals in the team? Just tell me about that because your debut, uh, people will know the historian, Blackpool fans will know the historian Robin Daniels. He said when new young players come into a team like Blackpool, they work their way in gradually. With Tony Green's case, when he played against West Bromwich Albion, it was an instant takeover. Now, just tell me about that team that you first went into. Well, when I first came, you know, I think Blackpool would be relegated, but it, um, Jamie was the ca captain, his captain of England. Gordon Long just signed. There was Ray Charnley, who I think was the best, one of the best players ever for Blackpool. Glenn James, one of the best centre halves ever. Um, who have I forgotten, there's somebody else. Then there's five internationals, Gordon Milne. And they were all dead, I was amazed, they were all dead nice. You know, and I just thought when you come to England, they'd all be superstars. Glenn was, they were all so incredibly nice. And that's why I love the club so much. Tell me about some of the stories. You've got a good one about Morty and Jimmy. Jimmy was driving along the motorway, and Morty, he overtook everybody anyway, and he was signaling to Jimmy to go into the next station. And so Jimmy thought something was up with Morty. So, like, Jimmy was trying to keep up with him. Got into the next service station, Morty was waiting for him. Jimmy says, what's up? Morty says, I've got a new joke. Told him it and pissed off. Just give us, people obviously talk about the West Ham game, but actually there's another game that you think was your best performance. The last game I played, we beat um, Aston Villa 4 1, let's go to, and nobody has ever, ever mentioned that to me. Because it wasn't on television. You got an injury here, didn't you, which kept you out for a season. How difficult was that? And then the team you came back to, tell us about that as well, Tom. Well, uh, to be honest, I just thought it was something different about it. I missed two close seasons in the season, so I missed 18 months. And I did, really, I struggled to come back. And I played quite well, not quite well. And, but 
the, the games are played were on television, and that makes a massive difference. I know you told me that you got a couple of stories about Tommy Doherty, Bob Stokoe. Yeah, I don't know if Henry's met Tommy Doherty, but we were playing like a match here, and he came and he says, Scottish manager, he says, don't worry, he says, but however you play, you're going to play the next game for Scotland. So he says, that's very kind of you, he says, so just go out and play your game. So we're playing and I scored again, didn't score that many, but I scored. And then the Monday they scored, I wasn't even in the squad. And then another game, Bob Soko was in London and he phoned Tommy Doherty and he says, is Tony playing? He says, yeah. So Bob Soko drove from London to Hamden and I wasn't playing. So. One of your highlights of your time at Blackpool um, was, of course, the Anglo-Italian Cup final, wasn't it? Yeah, it was nice because um, we hadn't won anything and um, we thought it might be the start of something like the League Cup. But it was nice when we all won it and we all got on well. A few of the lads are in here and it was dead nice. We'll still love you, whatever you say here. But I, did, I was... Uh, I've asked a few people if they had any questions, and one that keeps coming up is, you obviously left for Newcastle, why did you leave? Well, to be honest, you've got to leave. Um, you've always got this burning ambition. If it's Albion Rovers, why do you leave Albion Rovers? Why do you leave? And you look back, and I went from £60 a week to £100 a week. Um, that, and having said that, I love Newcastle and your passion. And I love both of the clubs. And it was nice. You had a ch chance, of course, to play. This is uh, our Mecca and the greatest football club in the world, but obviously a, a club that had 50,000 average attendances and uh, an incredible culture up there. Just tell us a little bit about your time in Newcastle. I mentioned to Malcolm, by the way, I mean, he couldn't, you must have been really touched about Malcolm's words. Well, I tell you, it's nothing to do with, well, it's to do with football. The Astors, um, I don't know if you've seen these books, Cult Heroes, C-U-L-T Heroes. I don't know if, um, so the, the road one in, in Newcastle, I think it's 20, and I don't think it's the best players, it's the most favourite players, and I get included in it. So the fella phoned me up and says, um, we come and do a book signing? And I thought, and it was near Christmas, and I says, no, near the pools panel, um, I can't do it. And then eventually, I don't know if you know my wife, she's very quiet and reticent. <laughs> um, but she phoned them up and says, we're coming. So we went to do this book signing, me and Malcolm and Donald. And so we got there at Phoenix, a big department store. So we got on the lift, we got upstairs, and I said, I kept saying, yeah, no, you'll be there. It's 40 years since I played. So we got up there and the place was packed. I said to this block, excuse me, I says, um, is this where the book signing is? And somebody says, hey you, get back to the fucking queue. <laughs> <laughs> and of course you didn't even get to 26 and you had to end your career, but then you got the opportunity with the Pools Panel for 48 years and you've got great time to spend with Roger Hunt and Gordon Banks and Mr Callum. Yeah, we had some terrific times. We had to talk about it, don't we? we had six of us, there was Brian LeBone, David Sadler, and we had some terrific times. And me, Roger and Gordon used to go every year golfing. And then we were walking by this pub and it was Manchester City, we were playing Man United. So 
we just said that there's a walk outside the bar and we said to him, have you got the match on? He said, do you like football? We went, yeah. He says, I was a football player, you know. So we said, who did you play for? And there was some obscure team in Scotland. So we're all watching the game, three of us are sitting, he's telling us how good he was all the time. I would have done this, I would have done that. So halfway through the second half, United get a free kick. So I just turn around and says, I don't think that was a free kick. Gordon says, I don't think it was. Roger says, I don't think it was. And this one looked over, pointed his finger at the pair of them and says, when you played the game, that was a free kick. <laughs> I don't know if anyone, well, you all remember John McPhee. And I, I used to go and see John. He got Alzheimer's and he was over Hamilton. And I used to go and see John every week. And then I went to see another friend. And he said to me, are you Scottish? And I went, yeah. He says, I used to look after a Scotsman. Football player, John McPhee. He says, do you know who used to come and see him every week? He says, no, he says, that, that's commentator, Tony Green. <laughs> so, he says, I don't know what tie up John's got with that. So. Well, one of my favourite stories, and it always makes me smile, is the, are the many trips that you had on the train down to London and the Pools Panel. And, uh, that particular time that he put on the ticket truck, on the, um, on the ticket. Yeah, I, I look back, you, you work out, 40 years ago, Morty used to carry somewhere between a thousand and two thousand pounds in his back pocket. That's like 15 to 25 pounds, just in his back pocket. And, and, we, and we, anyway, so, we, he lost the tickets this time. And I said, we'll go and buy them. He says, oh no, he says, we can't pay twice. He's about 2,000 pounds in his pocket, which so he wouldn't pay it. So the next thing, we just jumped in the train. When we went, and they, when they, they came to check the tickets, we had none. And he just said to the block, he says, he's lost the tickets. And the lot recognised him. He says, Stan, he says, you travel everywhere for me for nothing. He says, but, he says, if an inspector comes on, he says, I'll be in trouble. Stan says, don't worry, we'll cover for you. <laughs> so we travel for nothing. And then another time, and I still don't believe this one, but at Crew Station, and you, you, I don't know if you remember, we used to get saver tickets and you could travel dead cheap. And Stan said, two saver tickets to London. This is about three o'clock. The block says, the next saver tickets, seven minutes to eight. Says you're not going to wait four hours. Stan says, oh, just give us the tickets, paid for them. And we just walked on the train, straight into first class, these two tickets. And the block before he left, he says, I'm writing the time on this ticket. So write 19 dot dot five three. Seven minutes to eight is your train. So the two has just walked in, walked into the first class, and then the ticket collector came in and he says, what's this 1953? Stan says, that's when it's going three in the cup final. <laughs> Go and stand up and say, yeah. And he just went, oh, oh, nice to meet you. <laughs> and I just sat there and said, I don't believe it. Tony, we literally could listen to your stories all night and we're absolutely hooked and hanging on every single word. But I just want to finish, ladies and gentlemen. When Mick, who was just absolutely brilliant, was stood here and I was stood over there and I was looking across a packed room of 350 people and I was thinking about the year that we've all been through and I was just thinking how wonderful it is to have friends and Blackpool friends and great people all in the same room together. You know, we've missed it so much.
And we've got a packed house tonight of 350 people. It's a maximum number that we could sell. We could have sold 1,000 tickets. We didn't even advertise it. But can I just ask you, because you are a modest man. You're very humble and unassuming. And people have talked tonight about your greatness, obviously on the pitch, but what you've done for the community, what you've done for former players, what you've done for this football club and fans, you're always there, Tony. What does it mean to you, 50 years after you left this club, to see this sort of response to you as Tony Green? To be honest, it feels better to me the way the club's going since we got rid of the Oysons. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think it's terrific. Honestly, what's happened? And I, I watch the support here and the, the sensational over there. It's absolutely sensational. Um, and I just, I just find the whole thing is terrific that people in the town are talking about the club. There's no animosity between supporters and and I just think it's fantastic what's yes. happening. Um, we could listen to this legend all night. But please put your hands together for the man that is 75 years young and we're celebrating not just his birthday but his contribution to football to Blackpool, to the town. Tony Green, these people love you. Tony Green! Happy birthday to you. 